My name is Steve. I definitely would be the upstart of this group. I've only been teaching for a year and a half, but I have brought with me some of my other backgrounds and experiences. One of those is theatre, and the other is outdoor sports and outdoor activities. So I would definitely uh, support and try and use kinesthetic learning in my classes. So uh, in the vein of that, I need two people to do a task, a kinesthetic task. Who is very bad at Italian and has no Italian whatsoever? Anyone in the room? Yeah, one. Come on. Anyone else? Yeah. Italian, not so strong? We take one person who's really strong in Italian instead. Rebecca. Rebecca, Steve, hello. Bianca, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so you guys can go over here. You can be uh, center stage. I'll step back. Okay? So the first word you probably know what we're going to deal with is dolcissimo. Okay? I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but that's the word we're going to uh, play around with. Okay? So the first thing, get a little bit loose, I want you to think of Dolcissimo as a word. Think of the tempo. Okay? So say it a few times. Dolcissimo. 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 So if we just break it down a bit, which part of the word do we think is the part we say slowly and which part do we say more quickly? What do you think? Dolcissimo. Yeah. Just play with it. Dolcissimo. Exactly. So we say the first part is slower. Yeah. The second part maybe a little bit, the tempo is a little bit quicker. Yeah. Okay. Good. It's not right or wrong, but anyway, the next part I want you to do is we have established the tempo. What's the rhythm then? The tempo will suggest the rhythm. Play around with it. Okay. Okay. So it has the word itself has a suggested rhythm and its tempo. Moving into that now, I know we're a bit loose, but just take our arms right, and uh, can we just think of some sort of gesture that reflects that rhythm and tempo? You say it and try and get some sort of rhythm. Yeah. Oh, do do? Go with it, go with it. Okay, you can go through. No, you go for it. You yeah. go. Okay. Don't yeah, so the slow Simbol. part okay. and the fast part. Yeah. Slow part and the fast part. Okay, good. So if we say this word a little bit different now, a little bit out there, can we kind of taste it a little bit? I used to say, use your mouth. Mm. Okay. Dolcissimo, yeah? Is there an L in there? Yeah, there is. There is. Okay. Yeah. Tongue right up there on the side. Yeah, dolcissimo. Okay. So. This was used in a different context, but if you were to think of that word, we think it's a noun or an adjective. So, no. What does it feel like to you? Does it feel like a noun or an adjective? It feels like an adjective to me. Yeah, on the money, on the money. Okay, so it's an adjective. Yeah, it has its rhythm, it has its tempo. If we were to say, for example, the cake today, I'm probably saying it wrong, it's very tall, Yeah. Okay. What, what would we think? What's, what type of adjective? What's it feel it's like? It's a good one. It's a good one, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Specifically as an adjective, what do we think? Dolcissimo. Extreme. Yeah. What do you think? Serious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So For you, I, I would you say it was delicious, scrumptious. Good. 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 Okay. okay. Well, that's that task. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, how is that task relevant for uh, teaching? Is it relevant? My specific context is with young learners. Is that re is that relevant for young learners? Maybe not so much. We've learned one word, and it was actually sweet. It doesn't really matter in maybe two minutes. That's not great for a classroom context. It was actually taken from uh, a project I did in college, and I was asked to perform semiotics. Very difficult, okay? But we had a very challenging lecture. So what we did was we took one group, uh, a theory from Anne Bogart, Vision and Viewpoints, if anyone's familiar with that, and she had six different tenets for character characterization. It was tempo, rhythm, uh, shape, architecture, and I can't remember the other one, there are six of them. And we said we'd apply those to uh, semiotics. And what's the best way of doing that? That's teaching a new language. That's where that came from. But in terms of a junior group, how is that relevant? Well, I think there are a number of tenets. The first, that was a guided experience. It wasn't a didactic one. We weren't told dolcissimo means sweet, yeah? So therefore, it has more depth as a learner. It's, you're kind of grounded in what that word means now. So. The first part, when you're teaching junior groups, I would say facilitate the experience, facilitate discovery. Don't tell them, okay? Give them the opportunity to have a feeling for what they're doing and a depth, okay? The second one, as you've all seen, there were a number of different learner styles incorporating that activity. I think as teachers, we probably would know some of them. It was definitely musical. It was definitely a musical element. It was kinesthetic, with the gestures. And also, it was actually logical. The order of the vowels and the consonants has a logic that suggests tempo. So I think it's important not to think of 
I need to cater for this learning style or that learning style. You need to find activities that develop them in, a, in combination. That's another thing that's important uh, when I'm trying to teach. Moving on from that, I feel in the last year and a half that maybe the classroom context is not best suited to me. So I was thinking, what other ways can I develop, continue to develop with uh, TEFL groups, but yet drawing on my own experiences? And that would be, obviously, outdoor education and theatre. So what I've come up with, the idea was that we have task-based. That's the very important point, that all of the activities are task-based. So that means that the language you use, the functionality is important, not necessarily the correctness or whether it's right or wrong. We give them tasks that are concrete. You do them as a group, and you use the language to achieve that end, to complete that task. The correctness is not important. Whether it's right or wrong is not important. And one example of that is in a team building game, you've got like a spider's web of ropes. You have to get a plank through the ropes without it touching the ground. And the way we do that and promote the use of language, we do a little bit of pre-teaching. This is obviously to junior groups uh, who are here for the summer. We do a little bit of pre-teaching for certain verbs, like pass me that, or expressions, or to twist, etc. Pre-teach that. And then they are penalized if they use their first language. And they have to use English to complete this physical, concrete task. You're not telling them that the language is right or wrong. They just have to use language in a very real, functional way to complete a task. And you're merely there to facilitate and or penalize them to start again. So uh, that's the idea. There are other activities, like there's a gutter ball, which you're thinking of. Just basically get a ball in a gutter from one end of the field to the other without a dropping. Sounds silly, but again, there's a communicative element. You explain to the next person how this works, what's the best way to do it, and you're promoted for using English, penalised if you don't. So that's the concept, Peak Adventures, that's the main idea. But just for the last slide, if I can get the last slide. Um, yeah. Okay, we'll move on to this guy in a moment, okay? But the, uh, so the main principle is basically what I'm trying to do is facilitate an experience or a discovery. Don't tell people they're right or wrong. The second one is use a combination of intelligences like we had there, musical, physical. Also make the task concrete and make the task, yeah, make it real and have language as a way of completing that task. Therefore, the correctness, whether it's right or wrong, is not important. You can correct that as you go. And I think that's more closely linked to language acquisition at a young age. You learn to get what you want. You learn the language to get what you want. The correctness is then, it's through, so, through social interaction, you find out what's wrong, what's right, and then also through other normative things like reading, etc. that the, the kind of correctness becomes important. At a junior group level, all you want them to do is use language to complete a task. They get them to get what they want. Then you can correct them afterwards. That's the context that I'm working in. And just how long do I have left? Three minutes. Okay, so in the last three minutes, I want to talk about this fella. And I suppose this is back to the classroom context, not so much in what I'm doing. And I think we have a duty as teachers to deal with this character. Yeah? I think especially in junior groups, you can immediately identify the, the don't in the class or the person who's put aside in the class. And I think... Your initial reaction or mind definitely at the beginning was to try and shield this person, insulate them, and try to avoid them being ridiculed. That's your initial reaction. And then the net result of that is you actually exclude them from activities. And that's probably not the best thing to do. I think a person in this situation and the dynamic of a class, even if they don't know each other, is very quickly established. The person who is devalued is identified quite quickly. And if you remove that platform for them to express themselves, you're doing them a disservice. Your initial reaction is just to take care of them, really. But you're doing the wrong thing. And I think activities like that, where they're group oriented where there's a clear task that they have to work together to achieve, it involves a person like this. Yeah, because it's just, let's get it done. Okay? And I think my background was in theatre, and that really, I was like this, but really through theatre, it kind of changed my dynamic in the classroom at a very young age, as a small kid, took part in the play, 
And all of a sudden, I had a platform to express myself from. And that changed the dynamic completely. And I went from being this character to that character. Yeah? <laughs> I went from being the kind of the quiet introvert to being the messer. Okay? And these two people are very, very closely related. You have the, the, the quieter kid who doesn't really get involved, and he never has a platform to express himself. And then you have this guy who's constantly creating his own platform. Whether or not you like it, he's going to express himself. So they're very, they're very related. And I think you need to provide a platform for these two people to actually work together. Then we have the academic students. Again, involving them in physical activities also loosens them up. They're not quite as concerned with what's right and what's wrong. And it can be a, a more commutative and a communal experience. Thank you.